All right, welcome back to um, our second of the semester, CRC Music in the Studio. I am Professor Omari Tao here at CRC, Professor of Vocal Music, and I am thrilled to have you back for another chance for us to connect you with great art happening in your world and today in your community. Um, today, we are excited to have three guests from the Chevalier Project. The Chevalier Project, of course, talking about, well, I say of course, but maybe you don't know about the uh, Joseph Bologna, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, uh, a contemporary of Mozart's, who uh, with a very interesting background, we've forgotten about, or he was pushed aside, but uh, through the uh, actions of these incredible artists today, we are getting a new look at this great composer, etc. I don't want to give it all away. Um, but to get us started with uh, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, uh, we want to start with a little bit of music from this person, a composer and violinist, and actually um, an excerpt from one of his uh, pieces, a rondo for violin and orchestra. So we're going to listen to Amren Olveda, who is a young virtuosic violinist perform a small excerpt from this bit of music and then we'll learn more about uh, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges from the team itself. So if our wonderful instructional assistant Gabriel Rivera would guide us, we're going to watch a little bit of that. Welcome back. Uh, that uh, was Amran Olveda, and we'll get the name put in the in the chat there for you. Uh, there it is, right there. Amran Olveda, at Olmeda, excuse me, and the uh, Sacramento Philharmonic and Opera uh, Orchestra conducted by Omid Zufanun. And um, wow, wow, wow! I actually got a chance to meet her um, at the premiere of the film associated with this incredible project. Not just music, not just film but education as well. And so please, if you would welcome with me the wonderful uh, team, uh, Deborah Pittman, Christopher Cook, and Susan Land Cook to the screen. Welcome, welcome to you all. Um, I don't know if you're, are you up there yet? I can't tell what number, but I, when I look at the screen. But anyway, I, I see your faces. Welcome you three, how are you? Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks for having us today. Absolutely. No, um, I feel like a little bit like Oprah Winfrey or something like that. Welcome <laughs> to the couch. Um, so we can uh, um, talk about uh, your wonderful uh, careers in music and the wonderful projects you are offering. And unlike Oprah, I can't offer free cars, but <laughs> there is free material that you are offering with this project. So before we get into 
more about the composer that we just heard, the incredible artist playing it. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, if you would, um, I'll start with, with to my left is um, Dr. Deborah Pittman. Um, who are you and how did you come to be a part of this project? I'm great, thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I presented a Zoom um, event for Susan Lamb Cook's uh, summer music uh, in the summer of 2020. And afterwards, she and her students uh, alike were really captivated by this particular composer. The presentation was on composers of the African diaspora. And um, I've created many multimedia uh, productions in the past, and she asked me if I would be interested in doing a piece about Joseph Boulogne's Chevalier de Saint George. And um, that's how it all came together. Awesome. And your background is? I'm uh, retired from Sac State. I'm a clarinetist, and uh, I have a subspecialty in musical theater, and I'm a writer. And I'm a ceramic artist, and uh, one of these days I'll retire fully, but not yet. <laughs> I don't believe it. There's way too many things going on with you, uh, so many talents. We'll share some links about um, Dr. Pittman as well. Um, and um, I'm so thrilled that I got a chance to meet Dr. Pittman over in my Sac State days. Um, she was so kind enough to invite me to co-teach some classes with her. So um, really, really great, great people are putting together this work and they happen to be ours in the city. So um, uh, Christopher Cook, tell us, who are you and how did you come to be part of this project too? I am a local theater maker, musician and puppeteer. And I was uh, brought on board. Um, to help out with the uh, with the kind of the creation of uh, some of the visuals and that sort of thing by a uh, friend and mentor Deborah Pittman, former student of hers, and so was brought on board um, kind of for the shadow work of it. And so, uh, yeah, very just was super stoked to be in on this. So we'll get a chance to see um, Christopher's uh, vision for how this all. Um, would make its way to the public and he mentions shadow work so um, that is a really really exciting um, new way of thinking about um, coming to terms with these musicians not just what you might what you might see in terms of film and video but instead this more abstract vision for exploring this person really really exciting wonderful and then of course the last of the trio um, Susan Lamb Cook tell us who are you <laughs> what's going on with this project what is this <laughs> Thank you, Omari. Um, my name is Susan Lamb Cook, no relation to Christopher Cook, although <laughs> by now we feel like we are after <laughs> spending so much time together. Um, I am actually originally from Sacramento, born and raised in Sacramento, but I went off um, to first to Iowa for five years, then to Europe. I spent about 10 years in Vienna. I finished a degree there. I did a lot of performing, a lot of traveling around in Europe, and then finally uh, came back to the Sacramento area. And um, for the past oh, 25 plus years, I've been teaching at UC Davis. I'm adjunct uh, cello and chamber music teacher there um, and spend a lot of time here in Sacramento. I play with the Sacramento Philharmonic and Opera. And I do a lot of creating of projects uh, here in Sacramento. Um, about 30 years ago, I created a chamber music workshop for the Sacramento Youth Symphony and Deborah Pittman and I worked together at that time. So we have a long, long history together over the years. And when during the COVID time, um, I realized last summer, my chamber music students were dying to do something in music. I created Sacramento Summer Music and uh, just gave Deborah a call and asked her if she would consider creating a lecture on uh, composers of the African diaspora as we were also featuring a piece by the Chevalier de Saint-Georges as one of our collage videos that we were doing with the students. And after the summer program, Deborah and I continued talking and realizing how important this amazing historical figure was and how much we wanted to bring his story to the young children, not only in the Sacramento area, but um, across the nation, if we could. So that was really the birth of this whole project. Fantastic. So just to clarify, this is a project, I put the link in the in the chat and we'll put it in again, but 
Um, to clarify, this is a project that explores this composer, Fencer, et cetera, et cetera, um, through film, through some of the musical excerpts, like the one we saw Amran Almeida do, as well as an educational component that goes into the schools, right? So we're gonna see, uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that later, but this is not just a concert. It's not just a, a biography, but in the project part of it is much larger than that, much, much further reaching. Um, is, that what, is that like most of your projects that you put together? You said you do a lot of programming. Uh, yes, actually, man, many of my projects are multifaceted, um, but I, I think, uh, Deborah, maybe you can speak a little bit more to, to the various aspects of the Chevalier project and how we came about, as in particular, the study guide. Yes, uh, so originally, um, Susan spoke to me about uh, some of my previous productions, and my pr productions generally include narration, um, music, uh, maybe dance sometimes, and puppetry. Almost all of my pieces have some aspect of puppetry included. And when I mentioned that, I think Su Susan asked for that. I can't remember how that started, but she said, well, there's a, a young man who does this puppetry uh, presentation um, with the, oh my God, what's the name of that group? The Sacramento Choral Society. Choral Society in Sacramento Orchestra. Choral Society, who does this big production, oh. and I mean big, with uh, the Grinch who stole Christmas. And I was like, yeah, I, I subbed in that group once, and I saw that, and she was like, we have to contact him. Uh, do you know him? And it's like, well, yeah, I do pretty well. So well, we, talk, we contacted Christopher, and uh, he showed us some of his latest work, and I was just astounded in terms of what he's been doing and how he's developed as a puppeteer. I mean, I remember he went off to graduate school, and he call, called me and said, by the way, I'm doing one of your pieces here. And uh, so it's amazing how all of this has weaved in and out and connected. Um, so it was Christopher's idea to move from shadow puppetry to shadow acting. And I won't say, I don't want to give too much of that away, but uh, that's really how this all took form. And Christopher, you seem to have this, I mean, you're all musicians, you all have backgrounds in music, but you've gone everywhere, every direction in terms of your study, in terms of building this career. So much of what I like about this series are in the music, in the, in the studio series, um, is that when we invite people on, it's often a surprise to our students that people have, you know, they started off maybe with a music degree or with a theater degree or with a dance degree, something else. But they end up having to acquire more knowledge in order to fulfill the visions that they really have, the things that they want. Um, how, for the sake of my students, can you give me an idea as to if that was organic for you? Did you just discover this or did you just start finding your way or did someone push you in many directions? Or how did this, how did you become or were you always this multifaceted kind of artist? <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> I, I feel like I have stumbled, stumbled <laughs> through into the most wonderful, like, facets of creating an art only through, pardon me, only through <laughs> the, the guidance, the random, uh, the direct guidance or random comment by amazing people that I looked up to in life. Um, it was Deborah who first said, why don't you, uh, you know, you know, there's this uh, puppetry class over at Sac State when I was an undergrad there and launching an entire part of my life that is a huge part of my life. Um, now, was, excuse me, I'm sorry, you were a music major at the time? Total, oh yeah, mu mu music major, major, minor in anthropology and um, an art, lots of ceramics, all that kind of good stuff. Um, I think, I, Deborah, I might have even taken the ceramics class because of you as well. Jeez. Oh, my goodness. Anyway. Yeah, those were the days when my clarinet students followed um, what I was doing. I would take a class just to make sure it was what I thought it would be, and then I would recommend it. to. And they, and they all went out in different directions and did that. That was very, very fulfilling for me. Well, great. It's, it's like, I don't, anyway. So, um, uh, no. Where was I going? I don't know. Oh, um, where, where you end up doing things. The, um, oh, I don't even know what I was talking about. Well, we're talking about how you ended up being so multifaceted and, oh, you know, how, no, what, what drove you in these different directions. 
everything is like somebody saying, oh, yeah, what about this? Why don't you try this? You should try that. And when you're young enough to actually, that branches out into these wild things. I was um, doing, I, I did some assistant conducting with the Sacramento Youth Symphony and was also taking some conducting lessons with Peter Jaffe down at the Stockton Symphony. And he goes, uh, he's like, oh, you're looking at grad school. And I was like, well, I'd like to kind of learn how to wave a stick better at an orchestra. And he's like, well, this is a really cool guy. Um, you might want to look into Jan Wagner out at um, Shenandoah Conservatory. And I'm like, I mean, I mean, he's very orchestra and opera oriented. I don't know. I mean, I'll put it on the list next three years of my life out on the East Coast running around with that guy. And it's just, it really is the result of a, a, a small, you know, question this then yeah you know and out there founded a uh, green valley theater company so founding artistic director of that and that's still going strong right now and is just a wonderful project there so yeah it is yeah we start off our life playing a clarinet but i mean in the you're artists you're either telling stories you're making music or you know what i mean it's like you have to you have to jump into all of it nothing is off limits i love that well i think that it's great that not only I, there's a whole dialogue I've had a conversation about um, saying yes, saying yes to opportunity. And this whole team here is about that. In fact, I should admit that I am a part of this project. I don't know if the, our panelists or sorry, if our guests know that I was invited to narrate and to perform in the film portion of the project. And it was very much a big, I do not have time to do that. <laughs> and then I learned a little bit more about it. And I, I said, okay, well, I can do a scratch vocal. <laughs> I, can, I can do that. And then I don't have time to do anything else. And then I was like, oh, this is sounding pretty interesting. Ooh, I, okay. I'm, I'm, mm, yeah. All right. I think I want to make this happen. And of course you all made it so easy for me to just plug right in mm -hmm. and, um, and put together this really wonderful, um, experience. And I have a feeling it's like there are going to be demands for more things like this. Um, and with that said, I, I think um, I would, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but in terms of our time, I think it might be a good idea to start actually looking at the meat of this project. Um, we will get to the education part of it before, uh, after this, but um, we have a film at the center of this. Um, and can someone set up the film, what it is, and also what we're going to experience today, we're going to share for the audience today. Chris, would you like to do that? <laughs> or, or shall we turn to the script writer? Maybe to the script writer. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pittman, please. So, um, the piece in its essence is um, taking a look into uh, what made Joseph Boulogne Chevalier de Saint George. Um, so unbelievably dynamic. And uh, as, as Omari was mentioning, the idea of taking advantage of all sorts of opportunities for all sorts, from all sorts of walks of life. Joseph was a fencer, he was an equestrian, he was a, a violinist, he was a composer, he was a conductor, and I probably left some things out of that. But um, it was really easy to get excited and, and write about this guy from so many different perspectives. Um, so the first part of the uh, film has most of the shadow work. And then we figured at some point it'd been, it would be nice to have Joseph come out from behind the curtain as it were, and address the audience directly because then we could really get into more of the heart of um, his emotional context. context. And um, so I think what we're gonna see is the point where he comes out from behind the screen with a few little shadows uh, edited in and uh, yeah. Great. Um, the title of the film is? The Extraordinary Life of Joseph Boulogne, Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Fantastic. Um, great. So we're going to show you, this is a, the, the ending portion of the film. Uh, and you will see my face and you will hear my voice. And, uh, and then we'll talk about it at the end. If you have questions about anything you've heard so far, go ahead. There's a Q&A. Um, uh, device area there at the bottom of your screen. You can also put things in the chat. And uh, if we have some time at the end, we will try to answer those questions for you. We'll also have ways in which you can follow and uh, contact these artists. But go ahead and let's take a listen viewing to uh, this incredible film work by this team. Thank you. 
I continued to rack up success after success, but my status in French society was still a conflicted one. Not everyone was happy to see me, a man of color, beautifully dressed and wearing a powdered wig. But many complimented me on my appearance and my top-tier talent. I have proven myself successful in so many arenas. Surely now I have made it to the top. Thus far, I had been celebrated as a fencer, as a conductor, and now my public debut as a violin soloist performing my two violin concertos earned me critical acclaim as a composer. My first string quartets were written in 1772. They were among the first pieces of this type written in France and would become the first of my compositions to survive the ravages of history. Over the next decade and a half, music continued to be the center of my life. I commissioned Joseph Haydn to compose six symphonies, which I conducted. I composed string quartets, concertos, symphonies, and operas, which were performed at the Paris Palais Royal. I had money, fame, important friends in high places, and social standing. My fame continued to grow. And in 1774, I received an invitation to visit the royal palace at Versailles to perform for His Majesty King Louis XVI and Her Majesty Queen Marie Antoinette. It was the first time that a man of color would enter the palace to perform for royalty. And I was excited to be performing for the king and queen. I gained the respect of many of the royal entourage and eventually became Marie Antoinette's music teacher. We often played string quartets together, but I was fired from that job because rumors claimed that we'd become close. Too close. Always looking for new musical styles to explore and conquer, I became fascinated by the stage, and two years later stopped composing instrumental music in favor of opera. Around that same time, the Paris Opera needed a new director, and I was convinced by my supporters to apply for the position. King Louis thought it was a great idea as well. Unfortunately, two of the singers and a dancer petitioned the Queen, stating, My honor and the delicacy of my conscience will not permit me ever to be subjected to the orders of a mulatto. To avoid embarrassing the royal couple, I withdrew my name and the post remained unfilled. This outcome was damaging to my spirit, my musical future, as well as the Paris Opera and the patrons alike. We all lost out. I had become familiar with a few arias from Mozart's operas and had visions of introducing the Parisian audience to one of his grand works. Mozart and I actually lived in the same place for a time. Count Sikigen was a supporter of the arts and we both lived at his chateau for several months. We appeared on the same concert programs regularly, and there was a bit more than friendly rivalry between us. I suspected that he may have borrowed a melody or two here and there. Listen for yourselves. Here is a passage from my violin concerto, Opus 7, that I composed in 1777. Now, listen to a section of Mozart's Kirchhoff 364, composed the following year. What do you think? Ah oh, well, it happens. I'll just remind you that I was born 11 years before Mozart, and leave it at that. While I tried to recover from the disappointing turn with the opera, the winds of dissent stirred outside my door. The Age of Enlightenment, a cultural movement, was starting in Europe and spreading to many parts of the world. The philosophy encouraged people to think for themselves, to work together to create a great society, and asserted that even those with little money or power should have the same rights as the rich and powerful. This got my attention. Before 1789, France was ruled by nobles and the Catholic Church. There were three basic classes or estates. The first estate was the clergy, the second estate, the nobles, and the third estate, the commoners. Most of France belonged to the third estate, and there was little opportunity for people to move up to a higher estate. 
The rapid spread of the popular and timely ideas of this age of enlightenment encouraged many folk in the third estate to stand up to fight for their rightful place. And why not? They had nothing to lose. The call, liberty, equality, fraternity, inspired people to take up arms to help bring about change. It became a very dangerous time for my friends King Louis and dear Marie Antoinette. I continued to suffer many dark days as the storms of revolution were brewing. For a big part of my life I had been friends with the aristocracy. I owed a lot of my prosperity to the monarchy. Choosing sides was a huge challenge. My loyalties were divided. On one hand, I felt a deep connection to the goals of the revolution that started in 1789. I had great love and respect for my mother. Our shared African heritage made me want to stand up to fight for the goals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. 1792, I joined the fight. The parliament established an army of 800 foot soldiers and 200 mounted personnel, consisting mostly of black soldiers, called the Légion Franche de Cavalerie des Américains et du Midi. The group was later referred to as Légion Saint-Georges. As Colonel Saint-Georges, I chose my good friend and protégé, Alexandre Dumas, as lieutenant colonel. He was the son of a French aristocrat and an enslaved African woman as well. I educated him in the skills of swordsmanship and considered myself lucky to have him on board. He later had a son also named Alexandre Dumas who won fame as the author of The Three Musketeers, The Count of Monte Cristo, and The Man in the Iron Mask. My leadership was celebrated and yet it was next to impossible to get the basic equipment we needed for success. Half my regiment was without horses, barely enough ammunition to go around, and most still missing home and mother. With many inexperienced recruits still on foot, it took us three days to reach the training camp in Long. In February, the Minister of War ordered me to take my regiment to the front. I wrote back in protest. Short of horses, equipment, and officers, I cannot lead my men to be slaughtered without a chance to teach them their left foot from their right. In spite of a continuing shortage of officers and equipment, my regiment was finally able to prove themselves in the Netherland campaign. The French Revolution descended into a paranoid mess. My friends Louis and dear, dear Marie were executed. Like many others who had previously been heroes of the revolution, I could be a good revolutionary one day, and the next day I was the enemy of the people. I had continued to participate in concerts and fencing events when I was free, but I was condemned by critics for being involved in what they called non-revolutionary activities. My legion had fought well and defeated the Austrian army at Lille. I had given all of myself to the cause. The blood of friends had watered the tree of liberty and yet shortly after our success I was arrested along with ten of my officers and taken away. My officers were released two weeks later but I remained in prison, falling to false charges of corruption and misusing public funds. I was dismissed and without a trial, imprisoned for 18 months. Still, I considered myself to be lucky, as daily I saw many of my fellow prisoners sent to the guillotine, also without the benefit of a trial. And I was lucky to have something to help sustain me during the long hours of each day and night. My music. Finally, the Committee of Public Safety ruled that no evidence existed to prove my guilt and in 1794 ordered me released from prison. Sadly, my freedom did not happen in time to see my beloved mother Nanon, who died just before my release. In spite of the overwhelming support of my men and junior officers, I was not allowed to resume command. In 
In 1797, I was given the opportunity to direct the Circle of Harmony, a newly established concert organization in Paris. In April, the journal Mercury posted the following review. The concerts which have been held under the direction of the famous Saint-Georges have left nothing to be desired for the choice of works or the superiority of performance. I survived the French Revolution by the skin of my teeth, and towards the end of my life, I once again became devoted to my violin and played like never before. At the end, I was taken in and cared for by Nicolas Duhamel, an old friend who had served under me during the war. I was poor and suffered from a series of stomach ailments and a bladder infection. Much of my music was lost or destroyed during the revolution and what survived was quickly forgotten. Oh, they did publish a few commemorative editions of my work when I died, but it was a bad time to be a composer of color. Any traces of my music were removed from orchestra repertoires and essentially from the history books. Neither omission from the world's major music history textbooks, nor a lack of musicians programming my music, nor apathy from publishing houses and record labels have erased me completely. After two centuries of neglect caused by systemic racism, as long as my music survives, I survive. Ah, but listen, I think that the music says it all. And there you have it, an excerpt from this incredible film, The Extraordinary, the Extraordinary Life, I'm gonna mess up the title of the show, The Extraordinary Life of the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Uh, there you have this wonderful visual and um, audio uh, version of the biography of um, this very, very interesting character. Hopefully you all, um, already learned a few things about this person who was a contemporary of Mozart's. Congratulations to you all. Um, I'm sure you have seen the, the film so many times <laughs> uh, in editing, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, all of that, like many artists, um, you see your work. And um, what do you think about it as you continue to see it numerous times now? 
Well, may I start? Because first of all, it's an extraordinary story with an amazing script written by Deborah Pittman. It was just amazing to be able to work with that, that story that she captured and then to have it delivered so fantastically by you, Omari, through the narration and the acting. And then the visuals that Christopher created was just the icing on the cake. And I think the shadow work, Christopher, I think it would be very interesting for the students in particular to hear a little bit about how that shadow work was created and particularly the contrast that you and the editor worked with um, toward the end there to get that really sharp contrast. Would you like to say a few words about that? Um, yeah, um, working in shadow is, you know, a really evocative art form. It's something that, um, you know, obviously live when you're working with live shadow puppets, you, you are creating a world through, you know, a very prescribed kind of view. And so you're able to kind of manipulate that view and really tell a story in a way that you can control all the visual elements at once. And it's really just a really wonderful way to work in something like this, because frankly, we are working very low budget as far as film standards are. And so as a result, it's like, how do you tell a expansive story that moves from here and moves from there and goes on and on and on? And basically you've got to, you've got to, you've got to let the mind create. And so the, you know, you have to let the mind of the viewer um, kind of not fill in, but um, uh, expound on as, a, as they're watching. And so to, and so silhouette is just such a really great way of doing that. And I don't know about you, but every time I see any silhouette, it's like your mind is always looking for what else is there. What else is there? A person might turn their face, but it's like, you could, like you, you see no details in someone's facial expression in shadow and yet they're all there it's part of the body movement it's like you're taking in everything at once in a full picture um and the fun part and one of the fun things about this we ended up creating it using um we decided very early on to manipulate the light source itself um so we ended up instead of just using a white light we ended up um using different colors for different sections and then we even use different textures in the background. None of that was done in post. That was all exactly what the cameras saw. We didn't have, you know, there, there was, it takes, a, people don't realize how much money all that CGI that we see all the time that is ubiquitous in films. I mean, it takes a lot of time and money and it's like, or you can just film it if you know how to do it. So we filmed it, it wasn't green screen. It wasn't anything like that. And so we filmed it with a big shadow screen um, and the, 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 the textures were, printed beforehand, and then we used colored gels on top of the light source there. The light source, yes, was a um, an old school uh, overhead projector. So yes, they still <laughs> exist. They're in the back room, they're in the back closets at a couple of schools. And I've <laughs> scrolled away three of them and I have them and I, and I protect them jealously. And I have like a dozen extra bulbs that I will probably have like for the next like 30 years, I'll be using these, like taking from these like antique bulbs that go into them. And they are so wonderful for not only live shadow work, but something like this. Um, we filmed in a brewery because of the space that an industrial, light industrial space has. So we filmed in a brewery. Um, it was in the middle of summer. It was insanely hot on the second day of filming. Uh, like when we had all the soldiers, that entire soldier scene, all that. We're sitting there and we're sweating profusely. And all these actors are sitting here in these large jackets and hats on. I'm like, yeah, march again. No, we're going to have to march across again. Keep marching. Everybody. And we are just pouring sweat. And we look over and one of these giant 500 gallon vats is boiling away. And it's just like putting steam into the room. And my glasses are getting steam. We're like, oh, and you can't open the doors because not only is the light moving through, but then of course you also have wind on the screen and all this kind of stuff. It is so that's how we created. Just know that it's in shadow, some things are very, you know, it's like you're just looking at it never as to what everyone looks like on the backside. You're always looking at what everyone looks like from the front. And so, frankly, a lot of times people are back there wearing some very weird things. And yet, like, I mean, some of those wigs are created by taking one wig and sticking another on it. Um, some of it is like, you know, we'd sit there and we'd film it. And, and then sometimes the shadow is in the way all the time. Like um, we had a moment where somebody, you know, 
I think it was Amari, you kept making a gesture, but then he had all this like frill on his hand. Oh, yes. And as a result, it's like, oh, it doesn't, it's in, like, you're not seeing the story being told if he's got all this extra stuff, where if you were watching it live, that would even add to, because you'd have hand be brought out by the frill on it. But in a shadow, it's like, oh, it looks like he's, what is he wearing, like a scarf around his wrist? I mean, you know, just, so things look strange, and it's always just, what does it look like through that small lens that we'll be eventually watching it in? Anyway. Right. Uh, so, yeah, there was very little post-work other than simply kind of getting that contrast to match throughout and that sort of thing. Does that answer And it was a lot of fun. I have to say, it was a lot of fun to do. Um, in such a short, compact period of time. I mean, you guys have been working over a large period of time to compose the piece, to gather up all the different parts. I won't even ask how long it took you to put together the orchestra and to pre prepare the music. That's also another element. We often forget that um, there's so many moving parts to this whole thing, but the film element, um, my participation was really short, um, but of course there's all the additional editing that goes into it afterward. Um, every single element is so very interesting and very unique in putting this together. Um, I was just thinking it would be really cool if maybe in the educational component, you can ask some, maybe inspire some students to create their own little miniature shadow work or something like that. That would be really cool. Like, you know, see what the kids could do and come up with and send you as a, you know, hey, we were working on Chevalier is what I came up with. Um, that might be fun. Um, but speaking of that, this piece, like I said, is not just the video of Amarin and others playing the music. It's not just the film. It is also the educational component of getting it into the schools itself. So could you tell us, we have a little excerpt of, of the presentation, I believe, on the, on the um, a student or teacher student guide. Um, can you tell us about that? Um, I saw this the, when we premiered the film a week or two ago, whatever that was, um, and it was extraordinary. It's rather, rather wonderful. Can someone give us a little background on that? Perhaps, Susan? Oh, sure, I'd be very happy to. And, and I'm sure Deborah has some things to say about it as well. But uh, both Deborah and I um, felt very strongly about the educational aspect of this whole project. And we felt it would be um, a wonderful thing to create a study guide, which would be paired with the story of the Chevalier uh, in terms of the geography of where he came from, of the uh, transatlantic journey that he took, obviously the slave trade, which was uh, in, in place at that time, life in France, um, music, and then of course, fencing. Um, that's such an important part of his life and as well as the French Revolution. So um, Deborah, would you like to talk about our partner who assisted uh, with, uh, not only assisted, she put the, the whole thing together, I would say, with our research. Go ahead, Deborah. Absolutely. Um, I've always been a fan of study guides because there's never, uh, when I used to teach the course in uh, American musical theater, there's never really enough time um, in the 15 weeks or whatever um, system you're working under to do everything that you want to do. And creating a study guide just really helps to um, further what you're learning. Okay, enough about that. So I thought we'll create this study guide and I've been creating them for years and I'm pretty darn good at it. And then I realized that, oh my God, technology <laughs> really stopped me in my tracks. Um, and, and it was not that I tried to do it, it's just that when we spoke with Sarah Brown, who is the um, creator of the study guide, um, when she started telling us everything that was available, all of the hands-on um, activities that the students could have through technology, I was like, okay, Susan and I are now your researchers and we're working for you and you're putting this together. So the study guide is amazing. Um, I would just like to say one thing, um, and you don't see this uh, automatically, but the show itself has such rich color and such vibrant color. And then Susan, uh, sorry, Sarah, we do that all the time. Sarah matched that color in the study guide. So it is something that really comes alive on the screen. And I think we have a little introduction to that to show you. Yeah, can we um, share a little bit of that if you wouldn't mind, Gabriel, bringing that to the screen? Let's take a look at the study guide. Introducing 
the Chevalier Project Study Guide. The study guide was designed to enrich the educational experience of fifth and sixth grade students, providing context to the life, music, and talent of St. George. My name is Sarah Brown, and I served as the educational partner in developing the study guide for the Chevalier Project. I am the elementary music lead teacher for the San Juan Unified School District in Sacramento County, California, and hold a bachelor's in music performance and music education, and a master's in educational technology. I have been teaching in public schools since 2008. The instructional resources found in the study guide reflect standards from various content areas, including, but not limited to, English language arts, history social science, music, physical education, social justice, and visual arts. The differentiated instructional resources are divided into six chapters. There is one slide deck for each chapter. Each chapter begins with teacher directions and a list of sample standards. Chapter 1 includes an introduction to the life and music of Joseph Boulogne Chevalier du Saint-Georges. Student assignments include listening and responding to music and determining the meaning of words and phrases as they are used in text. Chapter 2 includes an introduction to social and political events in France during the 1700s, topics such as the monarchy, the three estates, the Age of Enlightenment, and the French Revolution are introduced. Saint George was considered the best swordsman in Europe during his lifetime. Chapter 3 includes an introduction to fencing. Students will learn about the sport and practice three fundamental skills. Saint George was a classical composer. Chapter 4 includes an introduction to the elements of music and classical music. Students will create musical ideas and practice fundamental conducting skills. Saint George's mother was an enslaved woman from Senegal. Chapter 5 provides an introduction to slavery. Students will also listen and respond to a 19th century spiritual as performed by a contemporary choir. During the Age of Enlightenment, philosophers supported basic human rights. Chapter 6 introduces human rights and addresses the social justice standard, I know and like who I am and can talk about my family and myself. Teachers, have questions or comments about the study guide as you plan and or implement instruction? Each chapter slide deck includes the link to a form. Submit your questions or comments on the form. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for your interest in the Chevalier Project. Excellent. I'm just so thrilled every time I see that I just go wow, 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 such great detail. I hope that our students that are watching um, sort of get some ideas. Again, we've heard a lot about how um, the, the panelists here have created this diverse career um, in the arts um, and how they put all those different ideas together for this particular project. Hopefully you're getting ideas as to those things, that, those little gems, those little ideas that you might have and how you might start partnering with your fellow students, um, with faculty members, bringing those ideas up and making them happen. You don't have to wait. Um, looking at resources, finding the resources, someone who is wonderful, um, is it, I want to say, it's, now I'm going to get confused, it's Sarah <laughs> who created <laughs> the, um, the guide here. Um, you know, that's a thing that she does. She does that beautifully. That's a, that's a passion, right? Um, so if you're interested in the nexus of music and music history and visual art and dance and all of those different things, you may not know we did the premiere for this a uh, couple of weeks ago and there were dancers involved at that performance as well. Um, there's so many different ways to bring your ideas to life. You don't have to wait forever to do that. I've been putting some links in the chat. So please, please, please go check out the, 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 the websites for the Vita Chevalier project. 
um, org that um, will allow you to register for the materials. The materials are how much do they cost? Uh, Susan, Expensive. free. <laughs> <laughs> they <Everything's> are free. <laughs> yes, exactly. If you can click, you can get the materials free, which is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. There are many sponsors and um, grants that came about to make this happen. So please check it out, share it with, with teachers that you know, particularly in this region. Of course, um, one of the major sponsors, it'll say Vita Chevalier Project. Um, Vita Academy is one of the major sort of presenters for this. Go to their site as well and take a look at what they're offering and what they do in general. For those of you, again, students, the part of the Vita name is Teaching Artists Academy. So if you're interested in getting in the classroom, if you're interested in learning more about taking um, your musical study and, and growing with that, you're going to get some training um, that they can help support, uh, even financially, um, through while, while you're working on uh, your craft as an educator, as a musician, being in front of other people. Take, uh, take a look at the website, follow them on social media. Um, all of those things are very helpful to let us know that we've reached you, but also it's going to be great for you to continue to um, find these resources and bring them about. The Chevalier de Saint-Georges has been very inspiring lately um, after 2020 when people started to look a lot more at diverse um, creators, um, diverse um, thinkers, minds from our history that have been overlooked and forgotten perhaps. Um, and so it's been inspired a lot um, out in the media. There's actually going to be a Netflix film based on this character, um, on this person. There are um, plenty of other things coming about, maybe a play or something like that. And people are think, people have been programming some of his operatic work as well. So I hope that you will continue to search and look, find out more. I was inspired when we first um, offered this, this whole thing to um, actually present to get some photos done. I'm gonna to try to share my screen right now really quickly, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. But I actually, um, I was so inspired by this character and I kept thinking about the character when he was, um, when he was featured in a film about Marie Antoinette. Um, and they used a lot of very contemporary ideas along with traditional ideas. So I worked with the photographer, Tony Nguyen, to take a few pictures that I thought would be fun, inspired by uh, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges and so I took some photos, we got all dolled up. Here I am um, in some costumes that, helped, that Christopher helped me get, uh, as well as a, a violin there and a little funky wig stuck on my head. Uh, Corinne Novotny Gonzalez did some uh, great uh, uh, makeup and hair for me. And uh, we played with all kinds of different stuff with our pink background and we, we mixed up the times. Of course, here's the Chevalier in, in my mind's eye. Um, and here he is playing with food <laughs> items as well, um, with peeps and various other things. We had a lot of fun and I had a lot of yellow taffy for a very long time after that photo shoot. Um, and here he is um, representing the West Side. I don't know what's on the West Side of uh, Paris or where, <laughs> but we had a lot of fun um, playing with this character. And hopefully you will continue to explore how you can um, explore your favorite artists or those other artists that you're interested in. I'm gonna share a couple other links in the chat, but Susan, would you tell us about an, a, a couple of events coming up associated with this project? Yes, thank you, Omari. Um, just a week from Sunday, the Chevalier Quartet, which was founded in, in relation to this project, is giving a concert at St. Anthony Church uh, in the Pocket area, 660 Florin Road. It's Sunday, September 12th at 2 p.m. And we're being joined by guest clarinetist Deborah Pittman Yay. for a lovely movement of a piece by Samuel Coleridge Taylor. So we're very excited about that. It's part of uh, my Great Composers Chamber Music Series, and the program is called Concerts and Conversations, uh, It because we will have some time after the concert for some Q&A from, from the audience members. So thank you for uh, allowing awesome. me to say a few words about that. I appreciate that. Wonderful. And then in November, um, this sort of another, uh, another showing of the full film, perhaps, uh, mm -hmm. what's happening at the Crocker? Yes, in fact, Deborah, would you like to speak about that? Certainly. Uh, so we will be a part of the um, Crocker music series in November. 
And it will, will be very similar in many ways to uh, what we did at the opening at the Crest Theater last week. It was just a week ago, Omari, not even, a, oh yes, it was a full week ago. I know it feels like it was a big it event. Like a month and, ago, anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and as Omari had said, a lot of moving parts, but we had like a full, and we will have this at the Crocker as well, um, a full uh, cutout of Chevalier in his, uh, fencing stance and people could pick up um, swords and have their photo taken uh, with with Le Chevalier. Um, so the event in Crocker, uh, I'm sorry, yes, the event at Crocker is on the music series and uh, it's another opportunity to get to see it on the big screen. And I'm not sure yet how many of the uh, music videos that we're going to be able to, to play, but the music videos are really interesting in that um, they comprise the entire soundtrack of the film. And so um, that was really exciting, pulling that together. The Crocker allowed us to do their, uh, the music video with the, um, with the uh, Sackville Orchestra in their historic ballroom. So if you remember that film from the very beginning, I mean, the setting is gorgeous. And it just kind of, not just the music, but the setting really pulls you back to that time. Wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, you and Christopher about other things that you are doing in the community. Um, um, I was gonna share a link here to your website and your gallery. You are not just um, a clarinetist, not just a professor, not just a script writer and puppeteer, extort all those different things. You were also in a visual art form of ceramics, is that correct? Yes, it is. And I'm hoping to entice Christopher back to that as, as well. <laughs> yes. There's a link there. You can see some I've visual there. And years now. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Well, our professor, uh, Linda Fitzgibbon, is here watching right now. And she's just ah. uh, uh, Hi, an excellent assistant. So, um, so yeah, so uh, there is a, a connection there. Linda's classrooms are right next to the music classroom. And we inspire one another. I'd love to have you sometime, um, uh, Dr. Pittman talk to us about how you are inspired or what the connection is in music and, and your visual art as well. I'd love to hear how that works. Um, if music is way into one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, uh, and then also, uh, Christopher, you um, have your own theater company. You mentioned before. Um, I'm particularly interested in how various students can maybe get involved in what you're doing over the last thing I saw was a cabaret outside the brewery, by the way, on a stage that started off with a whole Baroque music procession, one of my favorite pieces, by the way, and they came in with their flags and I was going, what is this? It's a full on Baroque opera happening in a parking lot. Um, <laughs> so I got your musical background, all the creativity. There were musicians there, instrumentalists as well as singers. Um, what's coming up next for Green Valley? Well, Green Valley Theatre Company is a, a nonprofit. We're a all volunteer kind of group that does a about three or four musicals or plays a year, main stage productions. Uh, usually, the offbeat stuff. We're we're not doing we're not doing My Fair Lady anytime soon. Um, it's always <laughs> going to be um, the Black Rider, the Tom Waits musical. It's going to be my um, favorite. Oh, it's so good. I know, right? <laughs> Uh, it's going to be shock-headed Peter, destrual Peter. Um, it's wow. going to be the funky, it's um, the robber bridegroom. I mean, these very, you know, it's very fun to, uh, Nevermore. A lot of things that are local premieres, a lot of things from uh, from England, a lot of things that you may not have heard of. Um, and then um, in between each one of our main stage shows, we do a cabaret. We do a, basically a vaudeville style variety show that hopefully does a step up from simply kind of, you know, piano bar kind of sing along with the piano. We have a live band that's there and it includes all the things you could imagine, circus acts, um, clowning, obviously songs, sketch comedy and that kind of thing. And those go on in between each one of, in, in between each one of our main stage shows. And that's actually where we kind of drew a lot of the actors for this project was from that. The, the, uh, the Verite Cabaret has become kind of the powerhouse of the company. It's kind of become the identity of the company in a way. And um, because that's what um, the folks who participate in our annual show do for the rest of the year, because we're the annual producers of the Rocky Horror Show in Sacramento. 
Um, we don't do the um, the the shadow cast. This is the live production, um, and we're just started rehearsals this week for the fourteenth year of it. Thirteenth, fourteenth. Last year is a question mark. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And uh, yeah, we're the annual producer of the Rocky Award Show. It was a whole lot of fun. And on top of that, we get to do other wonderful projects with uh, Choral Society, uh, Sacramento Gay Men's Chorus, and then obviously uh, this incredible thing. <laughs> awesome. Really, really great. Our new dean, Brian, is out there. He wrote, oh, with lots of H's after it. So uh, <laughs> he's got some theater in his background there, too. So I'm super excited about that. Really, really great. I, I'm, I often think about these companies for, for my, as a singer, thinking about singing opportunities. And you guys should definitely be auditioning. But perhaps they should contact you also if they want to get their chops up playing in an orchestra maybe working you know finding out if they're ready to present something like that maybe audition maybe reach out lots of links in the chat this world is very very tiny yeah and there are so many many ways for you to create opportunities not just to find them and resource them but to create opportunities for yourself as students as creators as artists right now so um i'm so excited to um, have you all here as my guests today and as friends, buddies in the community and sharing all of the really great work that you're doing. Um, we're about at our time. Um, I don't see any Q and A questions in the Q and A, um, but if you have questions, you can always reach out to me and I will share them with our guests and perhaps they can write back to you, get back to you. Um, and, uh, but we were going to leave you with a little bit more of Amarin Omeda playing uh, the Chevalier de Saint Georges music from the original video that we saw at the beginning of our talk today. So, um, mm -hmm. Christopher, did you want to say something? Yes, I did. I just wanted to give one little shout out. We haven't mentioned during the there. There is a piece of music in the fit in in the film that is during the scene in the graveyard, the superhero oh, yeah. origin story scene there, and it is a <laughs> an amazing uh, piano piece um, by Chevalier, and it is. One of the most beautiful pieces for piano ever written. If you play piano, toss it into your repertoire, put it in your playlist if you don't. It is, and there, and the performance in this, there's obviously a link through this, um, through what was the gentleman's name who played this so beautifully? It is uh, Parker Van Ostrand, who was 17 years old at the time that he performed it. And I also wanted to add that Amrin Olmeda is 12 years old, the violin soloist. 12 years old, ridiculous. Yep, yeah, that correct. sends you right back to the practice room. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah, we'll listen to some more of her on our way out. Finding out more information, all the links are there. If you have any questions, definitely reach out to us. Thank you so very much, guests, for being here with us today. Thank um, you, Omari. What a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely incredible. So, um, uh, Gabriel, if you would take us out with all of this <laughs> wonderful music. And we will see you all next uh, Friday for some more CRC music in the studio. Goodbye. Thank you.